Hello there, my fellow civilized inhabitants of the Inner Sphere, and welcome to another faction lore video from the Battletech universe. This time we're gonna talk about the fourth of the five major successor states, aka the Three Worlds League led by House Marek. Like in previous episodes, we will learn a few bits about who these guys are, a short overview of its military, alongside lore concerning their government, economy, and society. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us learn more about them, shall we? The Free Worlds League is one of the five major successor states of the Inner Sphere. It is also the oldest, and it was the most democratic although ironically for much of its history it was actually ruled under martial law by a captain general. The Free Worlds League was founded in 2271 with the signing of the Treaty of Marek between the Marek Republic, the Federation of Oriente and the Regulan Principality. The new nation came together when it conquered the Stuart Commonality in 2293. The League found tougher opponents though in the Capellan Confederation and the Lyran Commonwealth. The League warred with the Capellans over Andurian and the worlds near it time and time again. The Age of War began as a conflict over Andurian, and the peace that ended the Third Andurian War paved the way for the creation of the Star League. House Marek took great pride in the Star League, but it was destroyed in the Amaris coup. The five successor states fought three succession wars from 2785 to 3025 to determine who would become the first lord, each war more inconclusive than the last. The League was forced to largely stay out of the conflicts of the early 31st century because of internal problems, including the Marek Civil War and the Andurian Crisis. The clan invasion provided a boon for the free worlds, as its industry provided the war material that the other inner sphere powers needed to stave off the clans. Even when Captain General Thomas Marek launched a punitive invasion in 3057 for the death of his son, the League earned a quick victory and settled back down to pace. The word of Blake Jihad tore the free worlds asunder, both from within and from without. The provinces warred with one another and split apart in 3080, though they still banded together for mutual defense. In 3139, Jessica Marek reunited most of the former free worlds territories under her leadership. Throughout its history, the military of the Free Worlds League mirrored that of its government. Superficially, under the control of Parliament, the FWLM answered to the Captain General, with the League's Central Coordination and Command Group issuing orders on their behalf. Along the border with the Lyran and the Capellan states were military districts, each commanded by a marshal who carried out the LCCC's directives. However, only a fraction of the FWLM were federal troops, or League forces, answerable and loyal only to the Captain General and the LCCC funded by the federal government. The rest were provincial troops, raised, equipped and organized by each province for their own self-defense. In times of need, the provincial armies could be mustered and placed under the command of the Captain General, but starting in the 30th century, this right began to be questioned. With the passage of the Home Defense Act, any province which could muster a majority in Parliament could declare up to three-fourths of its provincial forces unavailable, severely curtailing FWLM operation. Increases in the number of federal troops and the powers of the Captain General C finally culminated in the Military Reorganization Act of 3046, which officially removed the federal province divide and placed all the units under the command of the LCCC. The Free Worlds League military placed a strong emphasis on combined arms tactics, 
with almost all of their regiments featuring a large number of infantry, armor, and aerospace assets, as well as one of the largest navies in the inner sphere. The focus on battle mechs, however, did exist within their elite regiments, including the so-called Knights of the Inner Sphere. The government of the Free Worlds League was ostensibly a federal republic, with each province accorded a measure of self-rule, while the representative parliament served as the supreme federal authority, though for much of its history it operated under the martial law of a captain general. Membership within Parliament was determined by the amount of taxes paid into the Treasury, although every province was guaranteed at least one member in the Parliament, or MP. Parliamentary districts, or wards, were based on wealth, population, and other factors. Most MPs were determined through democratic principles, though given the wide variety of planetary governments and traditions within the League, from military dictatorship to theocracies, that did not hold true for all. This amalgam of regional and federal authorities, with some individuals holding multiple positions within the overlapping layers of bureaucracy, led to a continual struggle for prominence. At a federal level, the struggle for power between the legislative, the parliament, and the executive, the captain general, existed almost as soon as the nation itself was formed. The relative dominance of either side waxed and waned over the centuries, though usually the captain general accrued more and more authority. According to the Treaty of Marek, parliament was the supreme authority of the Free World League. Parliament had the power to pass laws, create taxes, and decide on appropriations. In every two-year session, Parliament elected a speaker, and then appointed ministers to oversee the nine federal agencies. Communications, defense, energy, foreign affairs, human services, intelligence, justice, taxation, and trade. These appointments also had to be ratified by Parliament, though compared to the fights over the Speakership, many of these votes were perfunctory. The Speaker and the nine ministers formed the League Council, which enjoyed broad customary powers. Although any MP could introduce any bill, tradition dictated that only the League Council introduced treaties, budget proposals, and tariff bills. Additionally, League Council members were guaranteed a hearing in Parliament, and so their proposals were far more likely to be voted on. Per the Act of Incorporation, at least one of the nine ministers had to come from each of the three founding League provinces, which itself often proved a great source of conflict. In addition to the main parliamentary body, the League also had the non-constitutional Lords of the Realm, a body composed of nobles who were, at the very least, planetary rulers. This body functioned in an advisory role to Parliament and could not vote. The Lords were not paid for their service, so very few actually chose to attend any given session. Nevertheless, the prominence of the members and their presence at court ensured that the Lords were given far more media attention than they actually deserved. Constitutionally, the Captain General only had the power to oversee military matters when so appointed by the Parliament. The Captain General originally held a one-year term that could be renewed indefinitely, however, eight centuries of parliamentary acts resulted in a much greater power for the Captain General. House Marek had a virtual stranglehold on the Captain Generalcy though there was no constitutional authority behind that, only historical precedent. Only two non maric captain generals were ever appointed, and both of them were disastrous. The Succession Act of 2310 essentially allowed House Marek the ability to select a member of their own family to be captain general. The formation of the Star League made the captain general a permanent position, because of an agreement with House Cameron, the Marwick Captain General was recognized as the Council Lord from the Free World League on the Star League High Council. Following the fall of the Star League, 
Parliament passed Resolution 288, which gave the Captain General broad powers, air tags, for the duration of the crisis. These powers included the ability to convene and dismiss Parliament, supreme authority over the Free World League military, the right to choose a successor, and the authority to nationalize industries associated with military production. Two more laws passed in the 3030s gave the Captain General even more unprecedented power. The Internal Emergency Act of 3030 was passed in response to the Andurian secession. The law stripped all the provinces, except the Duchy of Oriente and the Principality of Regulus, of their autonomy, subjecting them to the rule of the Captain General himself. The Addendum to the Incorporation, passed in 3037, at the insistence of Captain General Thomas Merrick, removed the ability of Parliament to use finances as a measure of checking of the Captain General's power, and gave him veto power over every law passed by Parliament. The economy of the Free World League, historically lacking in heavy industry, was long defined by its dedication to technological innovation and free trade, built on the strength of the so-called M-Bill. The unrestricted and unregulated commerce of the early Free World League led to a booming economy and a drastic shrinkage in the number of trading companies as competitors forcibly acquired or drove each other out of business. Concerns about this state of affairs led to many debates in Parliament, although every attempt at introducing regulation was defeated. After the Free World League conquered the magistracy of Canopus during the Reunification War, it invested heavily in rebuilding the periphery state's shattered economy. The magistracy returned the favor by using its cheaper labor and rebuilt infrastructure to outcompete Free World's businesses, which, combined with a stronger Lyran economy, plunged the League into a 10-year depression. Protectionism began to take hold within Parliament, although it still remained a minority compared to the free trade advocates. All of that changed in 2622, when Edmund McVeigh Hassan's book, Chains of History, was published, eloquently arguing that the current unregulated economy had only benefited the wealthy elite at the expense of the masses. Overnight, the protectionists came to power in Parliament, and while Starlig law prevented tariffs between member states, the protectionists succeeded in creating subsidies, low-interest loans, and other regulations to support free world's businesses. Protectionism control in Parliament only lasted one generation, before fracturing over arguments about long-range financial planning. Unlike the other successor states, there is no overarching Terran-based culture defining the Free World's League. Instead, the League is composed of a diverse array of peoples and traditions, from Eastern European to Indian, with the expectation of tolerance for different points of view. Though English is the official language and lingua franca of the League, many others are spoken widely throughout the realm, including Czech, Arabic, and Urdu. This mixing of cultures has allowed for greater expressions of individuality and considerations of different ways of thinking among the population, while simultaneously leading to greater disunity and hindering the ability to swiftly rally behind a common purpose. If there is said to be an underlying culture to the state, it is its entrepreneurial spirit. A popular stereotype has it that the people of the Free World League have trouble embracing philosophies which cannot be quantified in terms of revenue and cost. A strong belief in the free market, and that any person could, air tags, make it, formed the very foundation of the League, which was seemingly justified given the prosperity of the Star League era. The onset of the succession wars was a rude shock for the more utopian believers in the free market's ability to solve any problem, though it didn't entirely destroy the spirit. A more surprising undercurrent in the League society is a discrimination against bionic enhancement, 
while replacement organs and limbs on accounts of injury are largely accepted by all except the fringe fanatics, those who attempt to enhance the human body are met with bigotry and even violence. Part of this discrimination comes from the moral question of how much a person can replace of themselves before the human condition no longer applies. Part of this has to do with the fact that bionic replacement surgery is usually limited to the wealthy, creating even more separation from the haves and the have-nots. Attitudes towards bionics can vary between worlds, from tolerance towards all but the most visually apparent enhancements, to outright hostility at even the suspicion of improvement. And that, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Free Worlds League and the House of Merrick for today. Not a lot, I am aware, but do keep in mind that these are overview episodes where we don't yet go into the much more highly detailed faction specifics. Is House Merrick and the Free Worlds League among your favorite Battletech factions? Let us know why in the comments below. Was this video informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for more content. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you all a peaceful day.